following episode most likely contains graphic language, details of violence, and murder, and may not be suitable for all audiences. Your discretion is advised. What is up, everybody? Welcome to episode 43 of Murder With My Mother, the true crime podcast where I talk murder with, with my mother. With you, yeah. Can't even believe I'm your mother. I know, some days I wonder if you really are my mother. How are you? Just don't ever do a DNA test. I know, that's literally, there's a many reasons, but no, I know that one thing's <laughs> for sure. You're definitely, you're definitely my maker, so. What's up? How are you? Uh, I'm good. Just good. living life, yo. Living life. How about you? Same. Living life. I cannot believe it's February. I, I don't know. The, the year is flying again. <laughs> it is, yeah. Uh, I think we both got flowers for Valentine's we Day. We did. Who did you... Who did you get flowers? I got two, I got two sets of flowers. Oh. From both people that I work with. Oh, okay. So like platonic flowers? Yeah. Friendly, friendly flowers? Well, one's an old man that probably wishes, he always goes, I like your sweater. Oh. <laughs> he wishes like, <laughs> but then it's like, is he creepy? And yeah, he's pretty creepy. A little creepy. bit creepy. Yeah. Oh, like he wants to but wear it was you nice. as a sweater? It w- no, it was nice of him. He That's just good. wants to feel my boobs. That's all. Probably. <laughs> I like your sweater. <laughs> Um, well, I'm glad that you got some flowers and yeah. you babysat for me, which yeah. was really nice. So I could go out and have a nice little Valentine's Day. Two days in a row, actually. Well, not in a row, but two yeah. days for Valentine's. I'm liking it. Which is nice. I'm liking it. Yeah. Nana duty. Yeah. Nana duty. Well, I mean, okay. So let's think about where we are with this episode today. So the episode that I chose today, we're going to just hop right into this shit today. Um, no fucking around today. Well, no, no fucking around, but actually kind of have to backtrack a little bit. It's a little bit fucking, little bit of fucking around. Um, I wanted to kind of touch base about obviously everything. We do some current events every time. Um, there was something really that kind of caught my eye, obviously, as true crime does sometimes. Madeline McCann. Did you hear this yet? I did hear it. I okay. just heard it today, actually. Did you watch the videos of the girl who is who thinks that she may be Madeline McCann? Did no, you see I it? saw a picture, and I didn't really think it looked like Madeline McCann. I didn't either, but if you look at the pictures, she does like kind of a compilation video where it's like her and her and Madeline McCann's picture together. And then, you know, if you, if you are familiar with Madeline McCann, in 2007, she was a three-year-old girl that went missing in Spain. She was there with her parents on vacation. Yeah, they were on vacation, and they left all the kids in the room because Mm -hmm. the room was pretty close to the like all like several groups of couples all left their kids in the room and then it would be like they would each take turns going back and forth to check on the kids yeah and so uh at one point one of them went to check and madeline mccann wasn't there anymore yeah so it's it's been something true crime connoisseurs we all there's always cases that we all know right yeah and so john benet exactly kind of like a john benet Speaking of which, apparently there's been some new oh, stuff about fuck. John Bonnet. Don't, don't even <laughs> mention any other <laughs> cases because I'll just get all giddy. And, anyway, not giddy, but you <laughs> know what I mean. You know what I mean? Like when there's things that come up and it's like it could be solved. It's been like almost 30 years since that happened. And like I said, backtracking to Madeline McCann, there basically is a girl who is um, a little bit older than she would be. I think it was older or two years younger than Madeline McCann would be. But she's saying that she doesn't remember her childhood. She has a lot. There's no pictures of her mom pregnant. Basically, a lot of things that have made her believe that she could be Madeline McCann. She has the little mark in her eye and she has some marks on the side of her face, which are if you look at pictures. Plus, that gives me the shivers right now. It's crazy. It's crazy. So if it is, obviously, we will keep you guys posted. Um, and That would be so great if it, it was. It would be. And you hear that a lot of people being kidnapped and then 20 years, 30 years later, you know, they do something like DNA test. And it's like, what? I'm not related to any of my family. Oh, my God. This is my real yeah. family. And I'm... The yeah. weird thing is, though, is that, I mean, it's not weird, but there are way fewer cases that end up like that than well, the yeah. alternative, and it would be <coughs> awesome if she was still alive. Yeah. This girl's in Poland, right? Yeah, she's a Polish girl. So majority of the time, obviously, as we know, sadly, when a mm-hmm. child is taken, it, it is usually, it, it ends up in murder, right? Or yeah. usually some, because people are twisted fucks and they have, like, 
you know, obviously want to do deviant, something behavior. deviant and disgusting yeah. to a child. And but sometimes there are just people who are mentally ill and they are like, I want a child to be my own child. And yeah, you know, like the, the one case of JC JC Dugard. Yeah, and it's like you know she's taken. She's everyone's expecting the worst, and obviously that is horrible too. But to be have a second chance, exactly like have a life. Yeah, so we'll keep you guys posted on that. Um, from last time, our last episode, uh, the Idaho Four, not really many revelations, like anything new on that. No, I mean, I haven't really seen anything new. There's no. been the weird weirdos <laughs> online that yeah. are saying stuff that's not true mm-hmm. still. There's some speculation from, I, uh, like, I guess it's an expert. I don't, I don't know exactly what kind of expert it is, but an expert saying that they believe that Brian... Koberger left the sheath there on purpose to throw police off like but it's like I don't know what they're throwing him them off of because he's still super super sure that he's going to be exonerated yeah. which I cannot wait to see how that unfolds because I don't think I guess, that's even a possibility guess but. we'll see Brian yeah, so again, to segue into this episode today, um, people are fucking crazy <laughs> every every episode. Um, it's scary out there. Um, I know next episode, we do want to do kind of a little bit more of a dive into what's been going on locally, um, but it's not even locally. If you have seen anywhere, anywhere all over the world, people are like, shit's getting crazy. It's crazy, crazy, crazy yeah. right now. Again, pulling people out of this pandemic um, before, if you kind of do a little comparison before the pandemic, after the pandemic, I think people, and we've said this fucking 43 times probably because we started our podcast in the pandemic Yep, at the very beginning. Yep. There are people who were struggling with their mental health before that are really struggling now. Yep. So you see obviously violence, but imagine if you are someone who was experiencing violence before the pandemic, right? I mean, and especially if it's somebody, every episode of anything we ever watch, probably 90% of true crime is domestic murders, is your partner, your husband, your wife, either planning or taking part in your murder, murdering you, or not you, but, you know, uh, their partners. Um, And I can just imagine that before the pandemic, if you were in a relationship that was abusive, you know, domestic abuse does not care who you are. Um, Obviously, your partner, if you are being abused, it is probably because your partner is dealing with something like that, like mental health. Um, I think you kind of have to be pretty mentally ill to do a lot of things. Obviously, now people are, I mean, kind of almost too... You know, like that group where it's like, I'm being love bombed. I'm being manipulated. He's a narcissist. Um, all these things. Yeah. All of these terminologies that are being used loosely now mm-hmm. are, I I don't know, like. I'm glad know. everyone knows what's going on. Everyone, but <laughs> everyone's th- being a little hypersensitive, though, I think. Yeah. It's like, I don't think Joel, who really feels like he's in love with you, is love bombing you. No. For like bad reasons. I think that he just. He's just lonely for really, the pandemic. Yeah. And he really thinks he loves you, Trisha or whatever, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. So today's episode, we are like, we've talked about on, on this show alone, we've talked about probably some of the most notorious partner murders, right? We have Scott Peterson, Jody Arias, that yeah. one. If you haven't listened to any of those, go back to our episodes and listen to those ones. Um, Chris Watts, obviously he was kind of a familicide, but he murdered his wife, his pregnant wife, and same with Scott Peterson. And I think even fam- familicide is going up so mm-hmm. much right now. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, you, we've even like around here had cases of that recently. Yeah, there has been a couple cases actually pretty close to me that recently and locally that are people being murdered by their partners. Yeah, and very recently. For yeah, sure. and so domestic abuse doesn't always have to be you know the black eye, the um, the women's shelter, people running away, pe- you know, people leaving. As soon as someone hits you, you know, your first thing is, oh, well, I would just leave. But sometimes it's not that easy because most of the times, I think 100% of the time, I it's agree. never easy. But it is something you you think you know what an abuser looks like. You think you know what an abuser is, you know, all about and what someone who was being abused would look like. But not all of the time it happens that way. It's not just, you know 
someone with no job that's or yeah or someone know. that's drunk or someone that's high yeah. or someone that you know no is jealous like there's there's definitely many people and like we're going to talk about today someone that no one would ever see in that way no ever and that's just the thing right it doesn't matter it, it doesn't discriminate right it's yeah. not who you are what you're doing it it can get you anywhere and usually it's in your home and it's can it affects everybody obviously right I mean yeah and it doesn't always have to be hitting. It can be emotional abuse, um, sexual abuse. I had somebody the, the other day, I heard them say, like, how could your husband rape you? And it's like, what? Yeah, like, because you don't want to do it. No, exactly. Right. So little things like that. There's so many things that I, I think after the pandemic, a lot of people are, I mean, a lot of people broke up during the pandemic. Maybe it's because a lot of people, I mean, I did too, but I, I just went twice. like, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. But yeah, I think uh, for anyway, I'm going to stop rambling after I said, like, I'm going to get right to the <laughs> episode today. Yeah. Here I go. Ramble, so, ramble, ramble. yeah, but that's the thing is, and I know domestic violence has always been a huge issue, but I just feel because of the testiness of everybody's mental health right now, it's really, really skyrocketed. Like, I heard a statistic the other day. In Canada alone, every two and a half days, a woman is murdered by her significant other. Ugh. Every two and a half days. And that's only in Canada. So imagine the United States, the population is what, like, how much, how many people live there? A lot. There's, like, I know, <laughs> I know that the amount of people live in Canada live in California. Yeah. So I bet in California, this is just me making this up, but if Canada is like that, California is probably double that. It's probably every day somebody's being murdered. Well, and you think of the, I mean, we've also touched upon um, some of the countries where it's customary honor killings, um, things when someone is not um, holding your family up to a standard that you yeah. perceive they, they are supposed to. And many of those countries are very, very heavy, po heavily populated. So mm -hmm. you imagine the numbers there. Exactly. It's and intense. that's, that's all, I mean, abuse obviously is never like, there's never a reason that justifies abuse, never. right? But in countries like that, there's even more reasons that t to you and I, I mean, <laughs> Well, it's perceived there's that there exactly, are more reasons. Exactly. But there there's no is ever never a reason. reason yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, um, our case today covers that exactly. Like we said, uh, a relationship that seemed to be picture perfect, um, perfect husband, perfect kids, perfect life, perfect job, right? They and both had perfect jobs. Yeah, and that this the story ends in tragedy, or we wouldn't be talking about it on Murder with My Mother. So. I will just hop right into the episode, so. Do it. Here it, it. Today we will be talking about the murder of Dr. Elena Frick, which her married name was actually Shamji. But, I mean, I think after this, obviously you guys understand what I'm talking about. I don't think that, the, you know, Frick is her maiden name, and I feel like. That's the one she should stick to. Exactly. So, with that, we will get into the episode. So. There was a couple walking by the Humber River, and this was on Thursday, December 1st, 2016, around 3 p.m. in the York District of Ontario, which is about 35 kilometers north of Toronto. So the couple was walking, and they saw, they're walking over a bridge, and they saw what appeared to be a suitcase lodged underneath the bridge. So... I would call that in because a suitcase is never good. No, a suitcase, a garbage bag, a cooler, those three. There was a suitcase outside my house and my dog kept going over to oh it a God. little while ago and I was like, fuck, no, yeah. no. Fuck, right? Like, I don't want to. Like, I mean, it was just some nasty garbage, but I was but, like. But you never know, <laughs> yeah, right? I didn't, I definitely didn't check it out myself. No. And so obviously, like I said, there's a certain kind of people, a lot of people will just walk by that and be like, oh, a suitcase. But this person who, the man who was in the couple, um, he was a, a volunteer firefighter. So he probably thought like, okay, call it in. Because yeah. people who are familiar with true crime or with real life crime or things that happen know that a suitcase in the river can a never be. Could spell something bad. Exactly. And so to their shock, obviously, when uh, authorities opened up the suitcase, they found a body of a woman inside. But there was also a tag on the suitcase, and the tag had a name on it. The name was Anna Frick, and that name matched a woman who had reported her daughter, Dr. Elena Shamji, missing earlier that same day. 
Sadly, now that Elena was no longer missing and the discovery of her body would quickly point to one person with a clear motive, her husband, renowned neurosurgeon, Dr. Mohammed Shamji. What the hell? Yeah. So Elena was born on August 17th, 1976 to her parents, Anna and Joseph. Not Joseph, but Joseph with a P. So they um, were Croatian, from a Croatian family, and she was the second born after a long and tough road of failed pregnancies. So they had their first daughter, and then between her, um, her name's Christine, and before, uh, or sorry, her name's Carolyn, her name's not Christine, I was looking at you, and your, <laughs> and na- my name's, your also name's not Christine. not Christine either, but <laughs> I guess, I don't know. So everyone in the other Everybody, everyone in the world. the world thinks my name is Christine, but it's not. But it's not. So, because like I said, there was so many, they had failed pregnancies, miscarriages in between. When they finally got her, they called her like their, it was their miracle yeah. baby. And when you see her mom on anything, <laughs> mm-hmm. she's the most loveliest. Super she, European she's lady. super, and she totally shoots like right from the hip. Like, oh, she tells super, it super as cute. it is. Yeah. But yeah, she's super very, cute. Yeah, her and accent and her. Uh, yeah. So Elena was born in Windsor and she was raised in the town of Tecumseh. I think that, I don't know how you say that. <laughs> I don't know how you say it. It's T-E-C. Oh, I, I'm just going to say it's Tecumseh. Tecumseh. Somebody that's from. T- yeah. OK, I got <laughs> I got a, a Tecumseh. OK, so she went to. um She went to St. Peter Elementary and St. Anne High School, and she always did really well in school. Like, there's some kids where you're like, wow, (laughs) that kid is doing really good in school. I never got that. I got one of them. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, I would say it's not (laughs) not the person sitting beside me, but. Yes, my brother is in (laughs) med school. He's in pre-med right now. So, and I am not in (laughs) pre-med. I'm doing other stuff. I'm doing a podcast. So, (laughs) but. Yeah, I don't know if she got, like, talks to everybody every minute on her report card. Probably not, because she was focused on her studies. <laughs> but just, like, my child just got for the third time. Like, his mother got every year that I went to school. But anyway, so she did really well in school. And she went away to university in Ottawa. So there, she met and fell for an aspiring neurosurgeon, Mohammed Shamji, who went by Mo. And according to her family, right away she was smitten. And of course, if you are in school and you have dreams and aspirations of becoming a doctor or becoming someone, you know, and then you meet somebody with like-minded goals, like-minded. Well, and you have someone to talk about because the stuff you're thinking about is pretty boring. And if someone else (laughs) is thinking about it too, then it's like common ground. There you go. It's like a whole different level, right? (laughs) Exactly. So... Um, after they dated for a little while, well, and to say, actually, Mo was the uh, the son of a thoracic surgeon and a psychiatrist. Oh, so, my goodness. Yeah. So talk about pressure, right? I mean, I'm sure he probably was, like, super hard on himself because that's just, I mean, my... <laughs> I'm I, hard on my own self and I'm yeah. <laughs> the manager of a bus depot. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so... After dating for a few years, in 2004, Elena actually got pregnant. So Mm. they had a wedding before the baby comes. Exactly. And I don't want to write that, like, (laughs) shotgun wedding and, like, like, you know, a question mark. I'll say it. Yeah. But they had their first daughter, and her name was Jasmine Anna Shamji. Oh. So right away after the baby was born, this is very, very common, um, well, for men who are not maturely... I don't even know how to. Ready? Well, just like mature in general. I don't know if you've seen the Pamela Anderson documentary, yeah. the segue, but Tommy Lee in that documentary, there's one thing where she had to call the police because after they had their baby, and then it might have been actually after their second baby, but they had their babies like super fast. Um, and this is really common for a lot of, like I said, men who are not, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, but he was like, I just miss my wife. A I, lot, just I, th- miss, I think not I think even a lot of only men, men that are, yeah, I think a lot of men do yeah. struggle because you have to think about how different we are. Mm-hmm. Our child is actually our very first true love. Yeah. So, and you just grew them in your fucking body. Yeah. Like your DNA is surging <laughs> through them. You can feel them. You can, you know. And then like your mother bear urge to be like, oh, this guy, like, is he really 
yeah. good enough to be no because most of the time they're here. not yeah <laughs> in the especially I mean in the first and I've had it you know both ways obviously uh, to experiences but it's like when you have a supportive loving partner who is just as much in love with the baby yeah it's very different well it's a bonding experience it's not threatening when exactly it's like that yeah but if you're like partying and going out and having so much fun and like fucking all the time and all this stuff yeah. with your partner and then all of a sudden their priorities change to yeah. be uh Maternally, breastfeeding a baby yeah. and like don't really want to go out and leave the baby and stuff like that yeah I guess for them it sucks yeah kind of self-centered really it is and that's what I mean because when you have a baby obviously yes the woman is the person who kind of bears the the major responsibility because they grow a life they birth yeah. a life somehow and you through those 10 months, majority of the time, I mean, depending on so many different factors, usually the woman all, you know, kind of does like a 180 and, or depending, but just in their nurturing, in their, you just, you want to yeah. take care of your baby. You don't want to leave your baby. You don't want to be away from your baby, you know, and your baby is, it's in your DNA to care for them first. You put them first and foremost before yourself, before your partner, so but sh so both of them should do that, yeah. right? So Shamji didn't like that. Well, no. And Elena's mom r noticed right away some red flags. Um, and so basically it was just, I mean, Elena would call her mom and her mom would kind of try to voice it to her. And Elena would be like, oh, come on, mom. You know, you, you don't want to talk to your mom about things probably that you can see happening. And I know I'm really bad for that. Like when I, and I've, I've probably brought this up before because we've totally talked about this topic before. But if I was ever dating a loser and like would come, which there was a few, um, would come to my mom and be like, oh, this happened, right? And she would give you, give me all of the things I wanted to hear and I needed to hear and I knew were true. And then I would go back with them. <laughs> and then you would, I would like avoid her subconsciously. You know, I was kind of like more standoffish because now I know how you truly feel. And I'm not trying to hear that about my partner who's so good now in this moment. <laughs> but I, Elena's mom, Anna, she said like, you know, I, I could kind of gauge that that was the last thing she needed at that yeah. moment. She's going through enough. So I just kind of, you know, I wouldn't bring it up. But about five weeks after the baby was born, um, there was a incident where Mo got really mad at Elena because the baby, she was just breastfeeding the baby. Like, you yeah. know, she was up breastfeeding the baby, but his family was over and she should have been entertaining them. So he got pretty mad because why aren't you downstairs entertaining my family? You all, you know, like what yeah. you think you have to keep this baby alive or something <laughs> like, so sh they got really mad and actually Mo ended up choking Elena. So another statistic, because you guys know I'm full of those. She should have taken stats. I should have. I know. Alex was trying to tell right me the now. other day how hard it was. I was like, nah, bitch, you don't know statistics? Come <laughs> on. But um, all mine would be murder statistics. So I don't know. That would probably get old pretty fast. But if your partner chokes you ever, PSA, obviously leave. Because Everybody listen to mm -hmm. this. If your partner chokes you, ever puts their hands and strangles you, they are 70, seven, I think it's 750, but I don't know if that was right. Either 75%. I think, it's 750. I think it is 752. 750% that they will end More up likely. murdering you, that you yeah. will die from homicide by that person. So if that's not fucked up, then... Yeah, like people don't just uh, put their hands on your throat for no reason. Like that's a that's a pretty big kill move. Yeah, but that's what I mean. If it doesn't matter, it, usually it, statistically speaking, is if you are murdered by your partner in the past, they have strangled you. Yeah, because this is such a your neck is such a delicate area. There's so many things that are well, you breathe, you breathe there. there. But there's even you know like. Just your spine, you know, it, there's so many things in that area that c could kill you. And yeah. if somebody's mad enough and they just squeeze too hard, it's very easy to kill you. So another thing that happened was in May 2005, the police were called to their house because he threatened to throw the baby in the river. I was going to say that. And blame it on her. And he said because of, you know, what he was in school for, uh, who he was in the community, he said if... If I did that, I would just tell them it was you and I would say that you're crazy and that you have postpartum and who's going to believe you? They'll believe yeah. me. They won't believe you. And it was like, so she called the police 
the police came and they actually did charge him. They charged him with uttering threats um, to her and to the baby. And they separated for a couple months. She went to a friend's house and her dad actually ended up coming um, from where they lived, which I think was a couple hours away, um, and staying with her and the baby for a couple months. Um, but as we know, most of the time this does happen, um, they reconciled and he actually, instead of the going through with the charges, he took a peace bond. She agreed to a peace bond, which meant that he would have no criminal record. And as we know, if you have a criminal record, you can't go to the United States. Can't really do much if you have a criminal record. Well, I don't know that you can be a neurosurgeon if you Or be a a neurosurgeon. (laughs) Exactly. So... What happened was because of the peace bond now, he was able to go wherever he wanted and do whatever he wanted. So she followed him and went with him um, and agreed to move to North Carolina so that he could go finish his PhD at Duke University. So in 2007, their second daughter, Faiza, was born. And Elena also completed her master's degree at Duke University. After they were done with their studies, they moved back to Canada, and they settled in Ottawa with their kids. And while they were in Ottawa, actually, the kids and Elena were in Ottawa, Mo returned to Calgary, and he did a fellowship um, for one year. And Anna, the mom of Elena, she said that that was the most peaceful time that she had because she didn't have to worry about something happening to her daughter. She's like, you know, and I've been in a relationship like this too, (laughs) maybe in it now, um, that... (laughs) that (laughs) I don't think that my fam, like not my, not that you don't feel comfortable when my partner's around, but it's not like a totally, you know, you can't say anything you're thinking because you just, it's a different, different personalities, right? Yeah. So Anna said that she felt like they weren't even family when she was there, like with Mo was there, Mo was there. Yeah. It was kind of like she had to walk what she it said, was always watch tense. what she, exactly. And it's cute because in one thing I watched about her, um, the mom's like, she said, like, she's feeling she has to walk on an egg shelf. And I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. <laughs> but, sh- like, she had to walk on eggshells, right? So, eggshells, obviously, we all know what that means. Unless it's Anna's mom, or Anna, <laughs> Elena's mom listening. Basically, you don't feel comfortable. Yeah. You have to watch what you say, every little thing, every step you take. So, they obviously, t- you know we're not a f- huge fan of Mo because he, first of all, he strangled. He said he's going to throw the baby in the river. He's just not a good guy. I can't even imagine getting over that. Like, no. I don't think I could, honestly. No, no. imagine if Car- if Carlos literally strangled me and was like, I'm throwing Kiana in the river. No, like, I can't. No, you would never even probably allow me to be with him, right? But then, like sh- Anna's saying, there's no choice. No, like, you're you an do? adult woman. Yeah, exactly. So... If, if things weren't, if he didn't do enough shit, um, when he was in Calgary, he actually started to have an affair also. But, and Anna, Elena's mom was like, get out, get out while you can. It's <laughs> yeah. your, it's your time. It's your excuse. This is what you needed. And yeah. she was like, no mom, we're going to work through it. I'm going to save my marriage. I talked to it, the person who it was, who he had an affair with, you know, they're going to end it, blah, blah, blah. The typical. It's so fucked up too, because that makes you realize how powerful um, this is because this woman is a doctor. Yeah. And she has such a great education behind her. She's Mm -hmm. so brilliant. She's so, you know, well-rounded. She was constantly doing active things, running marathons, working in charities. And she was this blinded by Mm -hmm. her husband. Exactly. So a little bit after that, they, like I said, they, they fixed their marriage. Well, you know, he obviously, who knows if he was continuing having an affair, who knows, but he did actually end up moving back home and he started his dream job as the head neurosurgeon at Toronto Western Hospital. So obviously things are going well for him. Um, And on the surface, it seems like they're just this power couple, right? I I I hate that saying. I went through and creeped. Um, All both the of their social medias mm-hmm. are still open. Yeah. And even there was so many times that looked romantic, mm-hmm. that looked fun, that looked, you know, that you see them at doctor's conference dinners and yeah. Valentine's days and trips and yeah, it, it's like, you know, him picking her up and, yeah. you know, the kids and. And so in 2007, no, when was it? 2013, they had their son, 
So now they have their two daughters and they have a son. And like at her friends at work, everybody obviously, when you see someone's life and you're friends with them on social media, you're like, oh my God, wow, such a Perfect. nice life, yeah. right? And so in 2013, her hard work enabled her to achieve um, the status of associate professor of medicine at the University of Toronto, where she became a mentor. And in 2015, she had her dream job actually became a reality where she started working as a family uh, physician at the Scarborough Hospital. And she was a member of the Ontario Medical Association where she held the position of the health policy committee. And like I said, her life looked so successful, so fun. She was fit, madly in love with her, you know, like with her yeah, husband. Yeah, beautiful children, a yeah. handsome husband. But everybody at her work, she told them, because I don't think it took long, because she would be like crying and people would, you know, she'd be really easily set off about things. Yeah. And just those typical things that you don't think right away, huh? You know, like you're kind of like weird, you know, all these things. You live such this beautiful life. But she told people like, oh, I refer to that as fake book. She said, it's my life is nothing like that. So the photos of travel, the photos of obviously they were they were at these places. But imagine the experiences that she's actually having as opposed to the experiences that she's showing. So they noticed she wasn't happy. And actually one of her coworkers was her neighbor. And I think sh they became quite close and she really kind of could see like she's crying all the time. It was very evident that something wasn't adding up. Everything you're seeing yeah. wasn't equal what you were getting. It wasn't equaling. It wasn't, it wasn't working. So her daughter, her oldest daughter, Jasmine, um, she was interviewed later after this happened and she said there was always a huge power struggle you could see she said obviously she had nothing to like really say because that's her only parents she's known but right uh, since she was young she said she knew that there was something wrong with the dynamic her dad controlled everything yeah she wasn't allowed to go for sleepovers mm -hmm. they weren't allowed to do anything the kids were very strictly controlled also yeah so and we know narcissists narcissistic personality disorder the number one thing about that is you want to control everything around you because you feel like you're, and like when you're a neurosurgeon, you hold people's like Brain brains in your, in your hand. <laughs> so the control of that, like you almost have to be a narcissist probably to do that job. Sorry to every neurosurgeon. You're probably not going to be a murdering I narcissist. they're watching. Well, you never know. You might be like huge <laughs> in the neurosurgeon community. You don't know, right? Um, but yeah, so... The daughter said, like, I didn't have anything to compare it to because those were my parents, but I mean. And children have such a, <clears throat> you know, such a open intuition. So even though they know that it's not something right that's going on mm -hmm. or they don't know, they don't have anything to reference it by, yeah. they can feel it. Of course, energy, right? Yeah. You know, I'm big on energy. <laughs> energy is the only thing that's true in this world. You can yeah. say oh, I'm so happy, and your partner is can be, I'm so happy too. But when there's something wrong, you can feel that in like your yeah. whole being. So because she was so sad and she was so unhappy with her life, um, what happened, I guess what ended up happening is there was some something that happened where they did like decided that they were going to try to separate for a little while. So what Mo ended up doing is he, they had a huge, beautiful home, and he moved into the basement. And so Elena was kind of more free, obviously, to that's do. A bad, that's a bad, I've done that one. That's yes. like living in the same house just creates more and more and more and more pressure. It's actually the most dangerous time for somebody is when they are leaving an abusive relationship. Yeah. That is the most, statistically speaking, <laughs> that is the most dangerous time for any person. When you're fleeing a relationship and you're in the same home, not even, there's people who flee relationships, they're in a safe place and that person can find them and harm yeah. them. But when you're in the same house. Well, the right? narcissist feels themselves losing control mm -hmm. of what they're controlling exactly. for all this time. And yeah. that's like, a, I don't even think they probably realize how strongly they're going to react to it. No. And so that's what I guess started to happen <clears> was <throat> after a couple weeks, you know, he was like, please let me come back up. We can work on it. And I think she was just so done that she kind of found her power and she was like, no. And so what actually ended up happening was she told like 
she told people around her because people know, right? And especially when you're dealing with people who are more educated on things, especially doctors, and you know because you've seen, you know, what could happen to a woman who's trying to leave a relationship like that. And I don't think that a lot of people knew the severity. Yeah. But they knew she was unhappy and they knew she was trying to leave. So she told people, though, she's like, he would never risk his career. He would never do anything stupid. Don't worry. Yeah. She even said to someone, like, what is he going to do, kill me? You know, and it's like, you don't think that something like that is going to happen to you, obviously, right? And so she actually served him with divorce papers. She served him with divorce papers, and he, this was the day before her body was found. And I think she also had a boyfriend. She did have a boyfriend, yep. She told her neighbor, who was her coworker, that she was getting a divorce and she was seeing somebody, and he was also a doctor. Yeah. So think about that for a narcissist. Right. You hear or maybe I mean, who knows if he knew, but you're probably going to dig. And if you if the person that you're have been able to control for all these years is finally taking their power back, you probably get suspicious of what's happening. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, but the body of Elena had significant blunt force trauma to her head and face when they um, did the autopsy. And the injuries to the body had clearly been sustained peri and postmortem, which means before death and after death. So she had blunt force trauma and strangulation, which she had been strangled before. Yep. Um, who knows how many times? Who really? knows? Exactly. Because I would imagine after you tell your family that and there's a huge scene and you go back, you probably, even though vic- victims should never feel embarrassed, there probably is a little bit of... I think naturally there is for sure. And then he does it again, but things get better right away. You don't say anything. Yeah. So the significant fractures in her neck and spine though, um, the coroner basically said that those were from her being, you have to think she's a a woman, a full grown woman and and she was put into a suitcase. Suitcases are are large enough for belongings. You're not going to fit me into a suitcase. No. And I mean, that's what I mean. It's like, could you... Like, you would have broken bones for sure if someone was trying to fit you in a suitcase, which is horrible. But, yeah, so, like I said, they, after doing the autopsy, somebody had to identify her. So, her parents came and they identified her because they were the people who, um, I mean. Her next of kin. Her next of kin, other than her husband. But when, so, you have to remember, there's her mom who has reported her missing on the first. And then there's a body that has been found on the first. And her body... I mean, they had the tag of the mom's name, so it wasn't hard to. This is the fucking stupid part. Like, if you're gonna, if you're a, such a brilliant doctor, yeah. why the fuck are you gonna leave a tag of the name on the suitcase? Yeah, and I obviously, you know, in a, I'm sure in a situation where you have just murdered your wife, you're probably not thinking that, but you obviously think obviously not. you're gonna use a suitcase. What do you use a suitcase for? You, you know, there should have been some thought <laughs> into that, but I almost think that it was Elena like her helping solve her own murder because there's nobody else that would want to murder her. They knew who the suspect was. They yeah, knew, but they did go. So when they were not aware yet of the body being found, um, her mom, like I said, it called her in as a missing person. Um, she had come to the house because she knew she was missing. Her and the dad came to the house and he, like, she said that I came down to the house. Um, right away, I started making breakfast for the kids and he came down and was like, what are you guys doing here? Did you call the police? And they were like, yeah. And she was like, Mo, it's so sad. Your wife, she's missing. Something's happened to her. We need to, you know, and he didn't seem, he seemed annoyed. <laughs> he said, she's with her boyfriend. What am I worried about? What should yeah. I be worried about? And so the same thing when the police came, the police came the night before because Anna called them and he told them the same thing. They said, your wife is missing. And he's like, she's not missing. And they said, well, her mom said she's missing. So if I ever go missing, everybody take my mom's word. You don't take her list. I'm just kidding. But it's true because he was like, nope, she's with her boyfriend. And he seemed annoyed that they were even there. And really, he's probably annoyed because he knows he just left that tag on the suitcase. Like, oh, (laughs) fuck, they're probably going to come here any minute. So... Yeah, so I mean, after weeks, like he he got he got arrested. Like it right was away. the next day after yeah. the body was found. But weeks later, um, obviously they ruled out possible motives, possible suspects. So yeah, on the second, he was arrested and charged with first degree murder and committing an indignity to a human remains. Um, after a couple weeks, though, 
because they did have obviously the evidence. But this one, um, this is really sad because her when someone's murdered and it really looked like she had a really good relationship with her children. That was one thing um, that I think was not fake on her Facebook was her relationship yeah. with her kids. And um, her daughter Jasmine told her grandmother a couple weeks later uh, that she hadn't been fully honest when the police had questioned her. And she said, the night that my mom went missing, um, I heard my parents yelling and screaming. And I heard them yelling a lot all the time because they were always fighting. Yeah. And this night I heard a big commotion. I heard my mom screaming really loud. And I heard a huge, like a bang, basically. Like a large commotion and then nothing. So she said that she was so scared. And she was only, I think, 10 years old. And so she was super scared and she went like she said I didn't want to go but I went over to see because I knew something was wrong and so she knocked on the door and the door opened the door and her dad she said he was over the side of the bed and he looked at her like something was really wrong almost a pa like in a panic but was like go to your room shut the door go to your room yeah which is so sad because that's that's who is you know having to deal with this for the rest of the you guys know me trauma <laughs> That's probably yeah. one of the biggest traumas. I just think of Dexter. I know that's horrible to say, but you know, like he watched his mom be murdered and he was like turned into, like, you know, because it's going to affect you. I don't think that this girl's going to become a serial killer or anything, but you know, you never know. But um, yeah, two and a half years after that happened, um, Sh Mo went on trial. He was supposed to go on trial. So, and now because Jasmine had said this to the police, they have, you know, she's going to be having to testify against her dad which no matter what yes he's in jail but you probably the fear of having I've I've known people who have been in the room or have been around when their parent other parent has been murdered by their other parent and that's never something that you ever forget no. or that ever leaves you or that ever does not affect you I just had a conversation with a boy that you actually went to school with whose father killed his mother in front of him and his sister. Yeah. The sister is um, com deals with complete mental illness, like yeah. something in her broke that day. She For has sure. schizophrenia, she's bipolar, and he is still talking about it, and he's mm -hmm. 30 years old, and it happened when he was seven. So Yeah, it happened in the second grade. And yeah. I again, even I will never forget that. Yeah. So, And I was, you know touched by it a small bit but it's like you never forget something like that especially no. if it's, and it's your still in the forefront of your mind every day all day plus essentially after that you are an orphan yeah you know so now the kids live with their grandparents who it's really nice because they help keep the mom's memory alive and nobody knows you as well as your parents you know just the kind of person you've always been your whole life so it's nice that they live with her parents so that they can continue to think of their mom and remember their mom and keep her as like a light in their life um but they said jasmine had extreme anxiety about having extreme. to testify like for for what the what did anna say for months and months yeah. she was not sleeping, mm -hmm. not eating, like not able to think of anything else because she knew she was going to have to testify yeah. against her dad in court. Yeah, and how scary is that? Because he's Super. already murdered your mom. You and obviously you're 12 years old. Yeah, so very scary. But uh, two days before jury selection was actually set to take place, Mo pled guilty. So he pled guilty and because there was little evidence that w the murder was planned beforehand obviously you can try to make that case you know he's strangled her before he's said he's gonna throw the baby in the river he's abusive he's done all these things that are abusive um but we know especially in canada we have such a great lawful country here <laughs> you can get away with things really easily because first degree murder means it's premeditated it doesn't sound like it was premeditated in the sense of like it was more of like a passion murder, a passion yeah. killing. Um, but so he, he it was kind of better for them because he um, he just pled guilty to second degree murder, um, which is kind of shitty because it's shitty in a lot of ways. But he because he had been in jail for that time, he was actually sentenced to life, but with a possibility of parole 14 years later 
And now, because he had been in jail for four years, 10 years after he was sentenced, he was eligible for parole. Yeah, um, they double credit you, I think, if it's before trial. Yeah. Um, he lost his medical license for oh God. two years. <gasps> what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So really, if he did get out of jail, <sighs> he could... Be, I mean, I'm sure there would be things that would stop that. And I'm hoping he'll never get out of jail. I hope he's never my neurosurgeon. No. Um, but yeah, so he was sentenced to life with no chance parole for 10 years at the time, but it was 14 years. Um, but that's from when you are arrested. And he was arrested the day after it happened. Um, he did address the court. Uh, I don't know exactly fully what he said, but the, he started with, Your Honor, I killed my wife. Um, like, I did. It did kill my wife. And basically he addressed his children and he said, I've completely ruined your entire life. Yeah. So at least he had some kind of hindsight of what he did was wrong. Um, I don't think that that obviously makes anything better. That probably being his children and being in the courtroom, I'm sure that's, you're probably just so scared. And he, there is a chance he could get out of jail. So, yeah. Yeah, so domestic violence does not just affect one person. It affects the whole family um, and even people around you that are not your family. So, yep, and like I said, the kids live with um, their grandparents, Elena's parents, and, yeah, just keep her memory alive. They go visit her grave pretty regularly. And, and even that's so sad. Like, I was watching the video of them watching, like, going to their mother's grave, yeah. and it's, like, so sad terrible it is it's really sad so that was episode 43 and i know it's just that's the thing you choose a partner you have babies with this partner you have a lot of the time though women especially if you're in your later years and you want to have no like childbearing oh. you know <laughs> like your maternal clock is ticking um mine's ticking okay <laughs> uncle baby you're not <laughs> you're not coming anytime <laughs> soon um but it, you're more likely to not want to see those red flags. We know a yeah, case people, close to yeah. here, right? I mean, you you're kind of not desperate, but you have you have a vision of where you see your life, and you want children. You want this, to, and if you have children, you're kind of more likely to stay because you think it will affect the children if you leave. And but what will affect your children more than if you leave is if they watch you get murdered, because like we just talked about, that's not something that anyone should take lightly, obviously, because, but. And if anyone's thinking of staying for the children, honestly, the bond that you have with your children when you're not afraid and you are not walking on the eggshell mm -hmm. and you are not living your life uh, f because of the repercussions that could happen to you from another human being, uh, trust me on that. You'll have the best, closest relationship with your kids ever like I raised both my kids single for 13 years and I don't know anyone that's closer to their kids no than I am. but also you, when you go through things like knowing that you're leaving for a better reason and you yeah. don't want that for your children I think that makes you guys closer because you're not only advocating for yourself and sometimes you need someone else to advocate for because you can't advocate for it's yourself true, properly yeah. so Obviously, if you or anybody you know is being like physically abused and you know they're in danger, you should call 911. Um, but there is a, um, another n number you can call. It's Victim Link BC. So um, this number is if you are in BC. Um, there's a 24-hour service available seven days a week. And the phone number is 1-800-563-0808. And it's anonymous, but if you, you know, there's so many resources, it's scary, but DM me. <laughs> if you're being abused, yeah, we will help you. Like that's, will. you know, you feel so alone and so like nobody would understand, but it's happening more than you think. And I actually just recently lost somebody who I know, who I've known for a long, long time. And it's the last thing you would even think, but the people who are closest to her, they know what really happened. And you know, sadly, she was murdered and it was by somebody that she was with and she was with for about four years. Yep. So, you know, it's not going to get better. If someone's abusing you, leave. They'll tell you it's going to get better, but it w is not going to get better. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. And yeah, just just leave. Just like I said, DM. Me and mom will come pick you up. If you live in the vicinity. My car smells like dog. But it I'll does. And you'll get dog hair all over you, <laughs> but that's It'll fine. It's like glitter. Slivers. It's like slivers your dog's hair. Yeah. But it's fine. And it doesn't kill you. 
No, exactly. So, but yeah, that was episode 43. Um, I'm pretty excited for next episode, actually. We have a guest that's coming on. I'm actually on. super excited, too. Yeah, and we will talk more about, um, like we said, Vancouver is where we are from. But I know from just keeping up with headlines from everywhere, everywhere's crazy right now. Everywhere's experienced an uptick in violence. And um, obviously, when we talk about that, murderers. I mean, there are people who are living amongst us who are taking advantage of people who are in, you know, different situations. Um, some people who are, you know, addicted to drugs, um, sex from workers. Vul- from vulnerable communities. Vulnerable communities. Um, and we will discuss that also in the next episode. I know we don't usually tell you guys what's going on in the next episode, but we will have a guest. So if you guys are Excited to see who that is. Um, <laughs> you guys will be excited. It's a good one. It so is a good one. All my true crime fans, Vancouver true crime fans, hint, hint. Um, but yeah. So it's a killer that hasn't been caught yet. No, that's what someone <laughs> said. I'm like, yeah, we're having a guest <laughs> on the next one. I was like, is it a serial killer? I was like, uh, no, what the fuck? We love serial killers, but we don't like serial killers. We love the stuff around it. Remember, and we've said that before. We don't like serial killers. Fuck no. Ted Bundy. He's stupid. But his brain works really different than the rest of us. So that's what's like, what the fuck is wrong with Ted Bundy? You know, yeah. obviously an example. But yeah, so we will see you guys in a couple weeks. We will. We will. We will never see you. You guys see us and you guys will listen to us. But anyway, that has been, this has been Murder With My Mother, the true crime podcast where I talk murder with my mother and forget what I'm fucking saying half the time. So have a good one. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.